So I'm going to do something I haven't done in uh, approximately seven and a half years, and that's uh, preach a series on apologetics. So uh, I'll start with this way. I'm sorry. We can go home now. When we're confident about something, we say we're sure, right? And when we sort of agree with somebody, we go, yeah, sure. And when we're faced with a variety of worldviews and opinions in our society about spirituality and faith, then what we have today is many people say, sure, if it works for you, that's great. But in the face of that, Jesus says He's the only truth. How can we hold to that conviction in our culture of tolerance? And how can we navigate this, what we'll call the maze of truth? How can we do that with humility and confidence all together? How do we pull this together? And so we're building this sermon series to helpfully help us deal, do this and so to deal with the questions that affect, I think, probably every family at East Cross, whether it's affecting you personally or not, there will be people in your family that these questions are, are affecting. So I hope you'll... Uh, this is kind of a teaching session, so if you're a note taker, this would be uh, a good series to maybe take some notes to remind you of some things later on. So when I was in college, I lost my faith. Now, I, I didn't want to lose my faith, but I got to a place, I was learning all these things in college and, and I was hearing these things that I felt disproved the Christianity that I'd grown up with. And so I lost my faith. Now, I, of course, I found my way back to faith and I have a stronger faith than I ever had in my life before this. But, but I've noticed that a lot of people don't find their way back to me. People who have left the faith for similar reasons that I did and they never found their way back. But I think what... What uh, uh, grieves me is that when I look back at the reasons that I felt that I could no longer be a Christian, and I looked at the reasons others give that they can no longer be Christian, I think it's altogether unnecessary. We don't have to deal with it the ways that we're dealing with it. Sometimes, you know, it, it's that a person found some issues with the Bible, seeing some contradictions or or maybe historical error or or they think the Bible can't be inspired because of those things, and so they, they just can't be Christian because that affects that. For others, they, they see some truth in, in, evolution, in evolution, uh the Big Bang theory, um, or some other scientific theory, and, and so somehow in their minds they've come to think that, that science and Christianity uh, can't coexist, and so they have that issue. And for some, there's a problem in believing that in a loving God, while at the same time there's this concept of hell to where non-believers go and suffer for eternity, and so they think they have to give up on Christianity. Now I know that some of us personally don't have these issues, but again, you know, a lot of our families do. In our families, we have different persons in our families, and and that that do those things and and have those issues, and and a lot of times that affects some of our. Uh, younger people, not always, but sometimes it, it affects the younger people. And, and uh, our young people, according to uh, statistics, younger people are giving up on church at an alarming rate. When you go back and you, and you start reading statistics, you find that, that youth are giving up on, on the church. And, and we need to know, I think we need to know, want to know why that is. A lot of them are leaving for intellectual reasons, not all, but, but some are. And uh, again, I think this is, is altogether unnecessary for them to have to leave for these reasons. But while this happens most often during a young person's college years, that seems to be the, the number one place that that happens, it still affects most of his family. So, so I want to, to help us provide, I want to provide a way of holding on to the faith that isn't threatened by, by um, all, the, uh, all the issues, you know, I want to help us have a faith that will stand up to scrutiny, uh, to, uh, that will stand up to whatever's thrown at it. And so that's what I want to do in this series. I, I, don't want, I don't want our youth going to the university or whatever it is they go next in life, the next place, with a faith that's vulnerable. 
And so they you know, don't understand. So I, I, I want to help us all do that. And so that's part of the reason for doing this series. Um, and, and part of the reason our faith becomes vulnerable, honestly, is because that in our society, we feel that there are some things that we just have to be, be that, that have to be believed. There are some things that we've decided that society has told us are very important. And so when we hold on to those things, we try to hold on to Christianity, uh, they're not compatible. And so that, I want to talk about some of those things as well. So here's the thing. We as adults are living in the same culture our kids are living in. Uh, we work in the same, uh, some of those places that our kids either do or will uh, coming up or you as kids uh, or young people will, will be working in the same places your, your parents are and types of places. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, we need to know what's going on in our culture and we need to be able to bring a light into our culture because that's what we're called to do as children of, Christ, of, children of God, as, as people of Christ, followers of Jesus, is to bring that light to the world. And so, um, so we're going to do this, and if it's not your issues, then maybe you can help uh, some of your a sibling or a, or a parent or a child or a grandchild to work through some of these issues with, with this. Now, what we can uh, be sure of is what, you know, what can we be sure of in this maze of truth? Because, because this is the biggest question in our society right now is what, what can we trust in? What can we believe in? But, you know, we're not the first ones to ask the question. Matter of fact, uh, Pilate asked Jesus the same question that we're asking today. I, and, and we're going to read that. So I want you to look with me. This is the Gospel of John chapter 18. And Pilate says this. So... You are a king? Now, I've never been asked that question. Okay, that's not the question I'm talking about. So Pilate says, you are, are you a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. I was born, listen, I was born and came into the world for this reason, to testify to the truth. To testify to the truth. Whoever accepts the truth listens to my voice. And then Pilate says, this is the question, what is truth? What is truth? Some people actually tell us that we live at a crisis of truth uh, today. And so one of the biggest questions uh, today in our world is, is what's real news and what's fake news, right? Uh, what, what are true sources? What are false sources for what we need to hear and listen to and believe in? And, and the thing is that some of our, even some of the institutions that we've, we've had a lot of, uh, we've never questioned it before, have come into question because of what's going on in our world today. And, and, and uh, even in this room, I would say that, that today that, that we would disagree on, on where we go to find the truth about things. So, so I want to start with, with taking a t historical look at uh, how we got into the mess we're in now, which is called the crisis of truth. And it's really uh, a history of relativism, okay? Now, I had to practice that word a lot to get it out. And we'll see how many times I get it out correctly. So relativism is, is uh, one of the issues we're looking at. So the, the, the nature of truth and the history of relativism go back to uh, the early 1500s to the mid-1600s. So that's a long time ago in, in Europe, when for over 100 years, there was almost nonstop Christian-on-Christian -Christian violence, okay? So... so Everybody was, thinking, everybody was thinking they had the monopoly on truth. And so, you know, if, if the head of the church under this king was, was leading, then the next king or queen would come up and they would be of a different faith or a different denomination or whatever you want to call it. And, and then they would kill those religious people and put their own in and if you go back and read history, you'll see that. And so for over a hundred years, almost nonstop, matter of fact, during this hundred year period, there were 28 major wars throughout Europe. Wars with a huge loss of life. Matter of fact, one of the most infamous of these wars during this time was called the 30 Years War. And this 30 Years War held a, a, a big part of it in Germany. And in Germany alone, now consider this, in Germany alone, 30% of the people died because Christians were killing other Christians 
because they didn't believe the same as they did. I mean, can you imagine? And the kings got together and, and ultimately they, uh, they, this prompted a treaty called the Westphalia, uh, uh, the Peace of Westphalia, uh, and, and it brought a truce to the religious fighting in Europe. That's what it did. And so basically what it said was you can't kill somebody else because they don't believe the same as you. They had to make a, a, a proclamation that you couldn't kill another Christian because they didn't believe like you did. You know, as Christians, you can't burn someone at the stake because you think they're a heretic. And so through, through this, this is the beginning, through this, tolerance was introduced as a primary cultural value uh, for, for, for our history at least. And so, and so also the idea that the government should not be aligned with a specific faith, uh, that really gained traction during this time. And so there's this beginning, this was the beginning of the idea of a secular state uh, where Christianity begins uh, to be moved over to the side or to the margin of society. I mean, they were the center and it's slow, but you know, it's been making this process now for for a few hundred years. And, and I know, I know that we really like to blame secularism on everyone else. But really, secularism is the fault of the church. If the church would have been the church loving each other instead of killing each other because you didn't believe exactly like I believe, if they would have been following Jesus, refusing to kill someone else, we wouldn't have needed a secular state. We can't blame it on anybody else. So tolerance. Tolerating each other, that's a good thing, right? Yes, it really is. And, and, and it's become even more important over the last 30 years because our society has become, uh, we have, it's so diverse. We have so many different people moving in from different countries, different parts even of this country and moving around. Bartlesville is, a, is, is quite the hodgepodge of, of different societies and, and religions and, and beliefs. And so uh, what has become, it's just become more diverse and so people have begun to see how my experience and my background and my culture affect my belief. And so this is a part of what's happening. So, and so here's the thing, while we can all say yay to tolerance, do that for me just once. Say yay. Yay for tolerance. Yeah, yay. And we can say yay for respecting one another. This has had this really interesting effect on the concept of truth. So, so we live in a pluralistic society with, with multiple beliefs, multiple lifestyles. And so we're aware that others do not believe exactly like we do. It's not like it used to be. So often because of and all this is because of cultural differences as often as that. So hopefully, hopefully we will want to be loving and gracious in all that we do. So it becomes, I think, easy for us to focus on the loving and gracious part of our, of our beliefs. And, and then what happens with that is, is sometimes you start hearing phrases like, well, that's your truth. You know, I heard that from a, a church person a few weeks ago. We had a, a, a difference about something. They said, well, that's your truth, but it's not my truth. Or, or we say, well, this is my truth, and so you know, this is for me. And so we start seeing truth as subjective, or we see truth as a relative term. Now, now this has led... Uh, led some to conclude that truth can never really be known, that there's no absolute truths, because we're all, uh, you know, we're all too immersed in our cultures, right? And our experiences to be objective, and so we can't see real truth. So, so in this culture of relativism, there seems to be no room for absolute truth, with some seeing absolute truth claims as leading to terrorism and violence. So, so Christians have even begun to see their faith sometimes through subjective lens. For example, if everyone in the household that born in the household that you're born in, if everyone else in that household is is 
is Muslim, you're probably going to be Muslim too. Or, or you can insert any religion there you want. So that must be right for them, but Christianity is right for me. So some see that claiming that something is true is just reflecting your culture. So this is true, so it's true for me, but that doesn't mean anything for you. And that leads some to believe that you really can't talk about truth because what is true in your culture may not be true in my culture. And truth has become this private commodity because relative truth is relative to you. And so that leads to no one being able to say that anyone else is wrong. And actually it's gotten to the place in our culture that if you believe something is absolutely true, and that is if it's true for all people, if that someone, and if someone disagrees with that, they're wrong. If you believe that, in our society today, our culture, you're seen as arrogant and narrow-minded. Aren't you? No? In other words, you're not enlightened. You're not wise. You're not, you're not open-minded. You're narrow-minded. So I think as Christians sometimes, we get this inferiority complex because we believe in things that, in absolutes, we believe in some as Christians, and, and because we believe something is absolutely true, then the enlightened ones look down on us and, and look as, as like we're just dum-dums, you know? And, and so this idea of relative truth, you know, really it's taken off, you know, in the last 30 years, part of it's because of our cultural differences. Part of it is because of terrorism, right? I mean, people believe something strong enough to fly an airplane into a skyscraper filled with fuel and people. When we see that, then we become afraid of absolute belief systems. We, we start shaking, you know. And so we decide, well, if Buddha works for Buddhists and if Allah works for Muslims, that's okay. I'll do Jesus. And so that's the culture that we find ourselves in. But how do we, how do we respond to this idea of relativistic truth? That was the other word I had trouble with, relativistic. I want to share five guiding principles when we're thinking about truth. And so these are things that, that you might want to take down and just contemplate from time to time. By the way, we do a going deeper class. I assume they'll get interesting this month. We talk about what's gone on on Sunday, so we'll talk about this. Here's the number one. Uh, these are five guiding principles when you're thinking about truth. The, number, the first thing is that religious beliefs are dangerous. Now, don't get mad at me yet, because, and you hear me out, because this is historically true, isn't it? I mean, I just gave you an example of 100 and almost 150 years in Europe. See, see, while Christianity has done a lot of good over the years, religion also has been a reason for many people being tortured and killed throughout history. And so when anything you believe is more important than life itself, which we would say our faith is, it's something you would be willing to die for, then it's easy for some people for that to move on to be willing to kill for, and it becomes very dangerous in that sense. Therefore, religious beliefs have the potential to be dangerous because people with strong religious beliefs inevitably get there as they get stronger and stronger. There's only one exception. Now hear this, because this is the most important part of this. There's one exception to that. If your core belief is that God loves all people and was willing to die for all people, including his enemies, those that were killing him, then your central beliefs will prohibit you from using violence even to protect your religious beliefs. This is the only ideal, only strong ideal and belief system that can't lead to violence. In fact, it's the only belief that rules out violence. So the claim that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is who Jesus says He is, is an absolute claim, and, but, but it's not the dangerous kind if we understand the real, real meaning, we understand what this really means, which understandably Christians have not always understood what this really means. 
I gave the example. Number two, relativism is self-refuting. So I want you to think about this statement. There is no such thing as absolute truth. Now, isn't that an absolute statement that you can't have absolute? Did you get that? Okay. A friend of mine was, was talking to me here a while back, and he was telling me about one of his family reunions. He was had a cousin that's a, a I think he's a professor at one of the universities, and and his professor is is he he teaches philosophy, and and so they get into these deep discussions often. And that side of the family, he said, always looks down on his side of the family, the the Christian side who attend church a lot, and and so they were talking, and they talked about theology, they talked about. Um, philosophy and and it got it got into this road of relativism and 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 at this point one point in the conversation my friend said that his, his cousin said you know I really feel sorry for you Christians and so so my friend he said why and he said well because because they aren't that smart you know well why don't you see it's a so smart well because you use this belief system as crutches, he said. And what happens is these belief systems just keep you in ruts of believing the same thing over and over, and it doesn't let you expand and become who you really can be. And my friend, he's funny. He said, do you really believe that? And before he could catch himself, his cousin said, absolutely. He kissed that absolute. He was, never mind. Go home and think about it. You'll catch it. He absolutely believed that there's no absolute in the world. Okay? So relativism is self-refuting. Matter of fact, relativism is an incoherent belief system. My friend said his, his, uh, his cousin got mad and just left the reunion. He just didn't come back. But relativism is incoherent belief system. It just doesn't go very far. It's, a, it's something that just doesn't work very, very, very deep, go very deep. So here's the third thing. Truth is always narrow. Truth is whatever corresponds to reality, and since there is only one reality, truth is narrow. Say, for instance, okay, you work in numbers, right, Leslie? So I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to give a big math question, so I'm going to have you answer it here in a minute. Okay, what is 2 plus 2? 4. Okay, one answer is right. Now, I can take every number between 1 and however many quadrillion or whatever those numbers are, and I could have all these numbers of wrong answers, but only one answer is right. So truth is necessarily narrow, Okay. But here's the thing, what makes you narrow-minded is not that you believe the truth. Okay, just because you believe truth doesn't mean you're narrow-minded. What makes you narrow-minded sometimes is why you believe something is true. Yeah, here's a question, are you open for dialogue and discussion? Are you open to the possibility of being wrong on occasion about something? Because here's the thing about truth, truth doesn't change. And if what you're espousing to is truth, you know, it, 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 it can stand up to scrutiny. Think about it. If it's true, it's true. It can, truth can stand up to scrutiny. So being narrow-minded doesn't equate with believing absolute truth. These aren't the same thing. So if we believe a certain thing and we believe it because the Bible says it, then, then we can't it's not being narrow-minded if we just choose it because somebody told us that and we don't know why we believe it and we cut everybody down else, everyone else down because of it, then we might start thinking about being narrow-minded. So what I encourage us to do is I encourage us to hold on to the absolute claim that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is who He said He was, but to do that in a way that will come across as and not to do it as a way that we come across seeing ourselves better than others. Don't do that. Because that's, that's leading to that narrow-minded thought process. Know what you believe. 
and know why you believe it and, 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 and go through the process, think it through. Remember, truth will hold up to scrutiny if it's true. Which is going to be true whether you believe it or not, right? So truth will hold up to scrutiny. So, okay, number four. No one really believes relativism. Kind of going back to that one. No one lives consistently with the position of relativism. I know it's very, 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 very popular in, in our society, but no one really lives consistently with that. Okay, um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, Howard, let's say that you and I are out on a dark road in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere, having this deep, theological conversation. Why? I don't know. Let's say we are, okay? We're out in this dark night and we're out on the road and we're talking and suddenly we see a pair of lights, look like headlights, coming down the road toward us. And so I wisely surmise that there's a car coming and I say, we should get out of the road. And Howard, you say, no, I think, I think it's a couple of motorcycles now, we probably should switch this around, right? I think it's a couple of motorcycles. I don't think we need to move because if we just stand right here, one will go by on this side and one can go by on this side, right? Easy enough. But here's the thing. There's not a one of us in here that's dumb enough to think that it's going to be a car for me and motorcycles for him, right? What's coming is coming irregardless of what we think is coming. It's not going to be a car for me and, a motor, and motorcycles for him. Now we may see and we may think some different things before we find out what really is true. But the truth is truth. And so, so you know, whatever's coming is coming. And so, so relativism, nobody really believes that because it doesn't hold water. So... And I think this, this applies to, to moral truth as well. And, and, and we hear this a lot today in our society as well. You know, everyone has their own ethics and beliefs about what is right and what is wrong. And, you know, it depends on your culture and, and your experience and it's relative to, to every person. So what's right for me may not be right for you. What's wrong for me may not be wrong for you. So no one is ever in the position to say that you're doing wrong. And certainly never think it's sin because, you know, that's outlawed. That's a sin to think somebody else sins, right? So, so you, can't, you can't even say that somebody else has done wrong in our society today because we have our own personal subjective morality. Now, now we all like relativity when we have our pet behaviors we're trying to protect. But, you know, outside of our little thing, and in real world, morality applies to everyone. If not, how could we have a World Council on Human Rights that recommends sanctions to countries who don't meet, who don't meet minimal standards in dealing with how you treat women, how you re treat children, how you treat immigrants, how you treat political opponents? You see, that presupposes, uh, presupposes that, that there is a standard that all nations and all people, all humanity, is to be held to. If not, then would have to say to that nation who, who thinks of women as objects to be done with as you want, that that's their truth, right? Or, or if you think sexual trafficking of children is okay, then if someone thinks that, that the, some society then who are we to judge them? No, no. See, we assume that these are moral, that there are moral standards and these apply to everybody. So as a part of morality, there is a moral code that transcends culture and personal preference. And that actually brings me to the idea that there probably is a being that transcends nations, cultures, and personal preference. But we'll get to that to another day. Okay. Let's go on. Last principle. I'll not chase that rabbit today. The last guiding principle I want to share today is this. Jesus made absolute truth claims. Keep this in mind. Jesus made absolute truth claims. You know, 
And I have good reason to think that his truth claims are true, and, and I'll talk about those in another one of, our, uh, one of the, the sermons that we're going to do in this series. But if Jesus' truth claims are right, then we have good reason to believe that all things are not relative. You know, Jesus claims to be the way, the truth, and the life, right? Read it with me. Let's read it out loud. This is, this is from John chapter 14 and verse 6. It says, Jesus answered, read it with me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How narrow-minded of him, right? Remember, whatever is truth is narrow by definition. You can have all the possible wrong answers. But here Jesus claims, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one, he says, comes to the Father except through me. See, and a hard as sell as that is in our, our pluralistic culture, it means that, that Jesus has pushed out, in these words, he's pushed out every other possible way of coming to God except through him. There's no other way, he says. There's no other truth, he says. There's no other source of life, he says. And no one comes to the Father, he says, except through him. So here's the thing when you make an absolute claim, absolute truth claim. You're either right or you're off your rocker. So here's Jesus. He makes an absolute truth claim. Jesus is either right or he's off his rocker. Now, now, I'm sorry to the Christians who are buying into this relativistic thing that, that Jesus can be my Lord, but He may not be right for you, so I'm not going to pose Him on you because there may be some other way for you to gain whatever you need uh, for the end of life and whatever. Because Jesus doesn't give us that option. He just doesn't. You know, with Jesus' claims, you either believe that it's a truth, or you either believe He's true or telling the truth, or He's off His rocker. See, see, here's the thing. I think I can respect the people who think Jesus is off of his rocker because at least they're consistent, right? There's some consistency there. But what's not consistent is to think that you're actually believing in Jesus when you're making him one of the ways, one of the truths, and one of the sources of life because Jesus just doesn't give us that option. You know, Jesus doesn't allow us to... to Take a plate and put a little Buddhism, a little Hinduism, you know, a little Islam, and then put a little Jesus on the side. You know, Jesus is the plate or he's not on it at all. And that's what, that's according to Jesus. That's not Jeff's words, that's Jesus' words. If you really believe that you're a Christian and that Jesus is one of the ways, you're a follower of Jesus, but you're, you know, then you, I, I think that you basically have an imaginary Jesus, like a Tinkerbell, something you made up, because it can't happen according to Jesus. If we believe in Jesus, if, if we're following Jesus, that's what Jesus said about himself. I didn't make it up, I didn't write it. So, so here's the thing I, I've read the Koran, and I've read several other, a lot of different uh, books, and, and think, think of them all now because I've read so many, but. But I, I find no problem. I think it's good for us to find good and value in other faiths. But, but when it comes to putting your faith and your trust in someone, it's got to be Jesus. It's got to be all Jesus or no Jesus at all. And that's Jesus' deal. That's not my deal. It's not your deal. That's Jesus' deal. Jesus won't be a part of the pick and choose religion. And it's not Jesus says. I mean, the New Testament is full of, of references. Uh, matter of fact, when Peter was, was um, uh, talking to the church council, this was the first time that the Christians got together to have this big council of all the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. And this is in Acts chapter 4, starting with verse 11. Uh, Peter says this, This Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. He has become the cornerstone. Salvation can be found in no one else. Throughout the whole world, no other name has been given among humans through which we must be saved. That's another definite, absolute statement, absolute truth statement. 
And boy, does it sound narrow. But the question is, is he telling the truth or not? Is he right or is he wrong? Are there many names from which we can be saved? That's the real question. Or is there only one name by which we must be saved? You know, and, and I tell you, Buddha and other religious leaders have a lot of good things to say, and, and that's great. I, I like reading some of the things. I have some, some of their philosophies that, that have helped me uh, to not be as, as bad a person as, as I could be otherwise. But there's only one name under heaven by which we can be saved, and that's Jesus Christ. So if the New Testament is right, if Paul, if Peter, if Jesus are correct about this, then that, and, and, and that is a, a relevant question. Then we just have to, to, to lock it in in our pluralistic society. And, and our culture of relativity. And understand that there is one God. There is one Lord. There is one Word of God. There is only one perfect revelation of God that came to humanity. There's only one image of God so that we can see how, who God is. There's only one Savior. There's only one mediator between God and people. And I'm just quoting Scripture here. And people, His name is Jesus Christ. There's only one Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and washes us clean and transforms us from the inside out. And His name is Jesus. He's our King of kings. He's our Lord of lords. He's our God of gods. And there is no other. And as far as Jesus is concerned, that's the way it is. Do we believe Him? Do we not? Remember, we need to hold to this truth. But please, 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 please remember I think it's imperative, I think it's so important that we do it without being arrogant and without being narrow-minded. We can believe a truth, and that's by definition narrow, but we don't have to be narrow-minded about it. It's a challenge. It's a lot easier just to say, okay, you believe what you're going to believe, I'll believe what I'm going to believe, we'll go on. We'll go to Walmart and shop together. It's easy. It's easy. That's not what Scripture tells us. We need to be who we are. We need to stand our ground. We need to know our faith. We need to, we need to be able to profess our faith, but we need to do it in humility and love.